My name is Paul Hardy. Uh, I've been involved with computers since I came to went to university in Cambridge, uh, and I then worked for a, a high tech company on the science part for many years and became a, a toolsmith to map makers, making software for people who, who make maps and geography and things. That, that's my my background. Um, the thing that got me into computing really was that uh, I'd never met a computer at school or anything. I didn't know what one was, but in first year university physics. Uh, they taught you Fortran programming and gave you access via punch cards, Hollerith punch cards, IBM 29 card punch sitting behind <laughs> you there, um, yeah. to the, the university's IBM 37165 uh, mainframe, which they recently bought to, uh, to replace the, the Titan that was still running at the time. Um, so they, they said, you know, this is how you do programming in Fortran. Here's a username and password go off and write some programs and, and most people thought what on earth do you write programs about but one of my hobbies at the time was church bell ringing campanology and uh, English church bell ringing isn't really music it, it's <laughs> mathematics we, we ring permutations and combinations we try and do a pattern of bells that produces every possible sequence without repeating it you know, a given a given element so I thought, well, computers ought to be good at doing permutations and combinations. <laughs> and so I wrote my very first program in Fortran to do plain Bob Minor, you know, the, the, the permutations on six bells. So originally to print them out as just as numbers on the paper, one, two, three, four, five, six, two, one, four, three, six, five, etc. But if you're an experienced bell ringer, you, you don't want lots of numbers. You want two wiggly lines, the path of the lightest bell and the path of one other and then from those you can work out what other the bells are doing. So I wondered whether computers could draw wiggly lines and that led me to find that the university had a calcomp plotter, pen plotter and indeed it could draw wiggly <laughs> lines. Um, so I, I, that got me into the early days of computer graphics and uh, I just finished reading Lord of the Rings so my next program was to translate from English into Dwarvish <laughs> and plot out the runes on the same plotter and things. So by this time, I'd, I'd sort of discovered I could make computers do what I wanted, and so I took a deep breath and changed subject from chemistry and did computer science as my third year, and uh, haven't really looked back. I, I don't regret it. My name's Chris Muller. Um, I uh, first uh, became responsible for uh, keeping a computer running uh, when I found myself as a teacher at Aldenham School uh, near Watford uh, in uh, 1974. Um, but I'd come into computing um, really as a logical progression from playing around with electronics, which I had done ever since I was small. Um, and um, I got quite involved at school with um, uh, tele telephony based on relays. And it's a very logical progression to go from digital logic based on relays to digital logic based on solid state devices. So. Um, uh, I was delighted to find that I had a, a computer to sort out at Aldenham uh, and was able to put a good deal of energy into uh, setting up a computer society and department there. Colin Rosenstiel, um, originally from London, and I, I, like the others, came here as a student. Also did the Part 1A physics with a bit of... I didn't get as far on the programming. And <laughs> and it really nearly put, it put me off doing any computing for some years afterwards. But I've done a lot of handy jobs and my stuff that inherited from my father um, who was also interested in things like control of, uh, of model railway uh, like automatic control he didn't bother about the, the making it look realistic but just to <laughs> use as a control system but I, and I actually had some electronic kits I had one with, one with a valve which came after the one with transistors which seemed more useful and about all I could do with them was a radio which didn't work too well so that was not terribly exciting it was getting into computing at work when we bought a uh, in a Redifon key to disk system which could program I discovered and it solved one of my problems with my interest in elections and how to format the output in tidily to, to make it easier to, to make it more readable. Um, I'd also got an interest in the single transferable vote form of proportional representation elections which the student union introduced while I was a student and I used to help them count their elections 
uh, first time in my last year as a student and then for the next 40 years afterwards. Um, and we, we started purely with, with, uh, with pen and paper to help do the calculations there. Start, tried an electronic calculator in, I think, 1973 we had that. And that uh, was uh, helped, to get, again, control the process, make sure we didn't make mistakes. And I saw the ZX81 when it came out as a realistic way to, to learn to program in basic and write a program to do that. And I did it, and we actually used it in anger. Well, <laughs> we used it while I was still developing it in 1981, which was a bit chaotic and overran horribly. We then used it uh, later that year in 1982, very successfully, um, and then discovered the limitations of the ZX81, um, uh, the backups I'd learnt about in the, in the mini days, but um, I learnt machine code in order to make it run faster, do more precisely what we wanted, uh, and so on. And then got an Amstrad PCW, which I didn't realise before then what word processing could do. I think a lot of people discovered that, but I also used the, the, its program. Um, uh, I, I used it for databases. In fact, the, the basic that came with it was more powerful for databases than most basic subsequently. Because uh, I remember I've still got a, a, a PC DOS, uh, MS DOS um, program with a database, which actually, for my election results, is the original ready for an application, which had some emulations of the Amstrad PCW basic in order to manage its database. And it, I, I was, it's just so long ago that I wrote it, and it doesn't need any <laughs> annual maintenance. I still have to use it, and of course, in 64 bit PCs, it's a bit of a pain to run a 16 bit program. <laughs> Uh, it's one of, the, but the, uh, one of these legacies that carries on and on, and that's actually one of my themes in IT because my time at Pi, Philips, Samoco, the radio business, you've got technologies there still going years after it ce they cease to be manufacturable. I saw some radios in railway locomotives the other day that dated back to the mid 80s and still going in use, and they're completely hard enough to maintain and completely impossible to manufacture because the scale of the electronics in them mm. is some, so archaic. Yeah, and some software lives much longer than you'd think. <laughs> I mean, the, mm. two thirds of the world's ocean shipping navigates with, British, with Admiralty charts done by the UK Hydrographic Office at Taunton. Because Britain is one of the is the only country that charts the whole world. It's a sort of relic of British <laughs> Empire. But but they're still using software that I and my team wrote when it had its last major rewrite. I think in 1983, uh, ran on Vaxes and then Alphas and, and on under VMS. So a very, some software is very long lived and uh, has a, has a long time. One of my uh, uh, previous lives, I was the um, sales manager for graveyard chips for Texas Instruments. Um, and one, one, of, one of the challenges with keeping all of this wonderful um, set of kit here running is that um, when you've used up all of the old chips, that is it. You, you cannot recreate a, 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 an integrated circuit made in the 1970s using modern equipment. You basically need to design the chip again from scratch. So. Um, one of the things which I got involved with was um, so-called all-time buys, where you say, okay, um, you know, we're going to make a, a final batch of these chips and uh, tell us how many you want for the rest of time, and we will make them for you now, and that is it. Uh, and actually, that applies to all semiconductors. Um, so uh, that, that is a real issue about the longevity of highly integrated electronics. Um, I remember one story where, where I... I got a phone call one day from somebody in California. They had, uh, in the 1970s, designed a, a chip from Texas Instruments costing 20 cents into some large machine without a moment's thought. Um, and now their last of these machines had had the chip blow up and they would fly anyone anywhere in the world to get this 20 cent chip. Um, and, you know, I couldn't find them one. Um, so, you know, that is a real concern about all of the kit that's here. Right, one of my interests is the railways, and I, I had these exactly parallel conversation with my ex, my then ex-colleague after I'd left Sunoco, mm. who, whose job it was to sell radios to, Br to the British Rail, it still was. No, it was mm. after privatisation, so mm. rail track then. And this is for radios used for radio signalling, which was quite an uh, advanced development on the roads at that time, and mostly in the highlands of Scotland, also the, the, the mm. pioneer was in Suffolk. And they'd used a standard Philips radio, system sophisticated one, 
uh, from about 1980, <laughs> perhaps a bit later. Um, sorry, perhaps even 1990, but mm. they, they just realised they wanted some more. Mm. And, and he said to them, sorry, even at the ridiculous prices you're willing to yeah. pay, we can't <laughs> afford to make them now. Yeah. Yeah. And the trouble with something like a highly regulated industry and safety conscious industry like the railways is that the kit that's been approved and been tested is that specification which yeah. is no longer makeable. You yeah. could re-implement it in more modern equipment. Presumably your 20 cent better. chip could be produced <laughs> in emulation. Oh, yes. but, but it wouldn't FPGA, actually... you can do most things. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, there is now a little cottage industry mm. that goes around the country finding these old Philips radios, <laughs> FM1000 radios, yeah. and repairing them and putting them back into trains. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I remember I had to do a project for London Transport once, um, uh, and the spec for the electronic design they wanted from me was it had to be maintainable for 40 years. <laughs> and that meant that I was restricted to using relays. I couldn't use anything more modern than a relay. And eventually right. they relented and said, well, actually, we're going to change our standard. We're now going to say the electronics only needs to be maintainable for 25 years, uh, which meant that at long last I was able to use... 74 series TTL because that had actually been around for 25 years and therefore might go on being around for another 25 possibly the, the same is true of, of software having having yeah. long life uh, you know the I I went on the, the company I worked for laser scan started with PDB 15s and then PDB 11s but moved on quite quickly to, to VAXs running the VMS operating system which open VMS as it came later and that which was quite a long-lived uh, system, but the the vaxes uh, got embedded in all sorts of, of expensive, very expensive systems, factory systems, you know, making things, stock exchanges, all, all sorts of embedded special purpose systems. And long after DEC had stopped making vaxes and moved on to alphas and then Compaq and HP doing integrity, and you still buy a, a new computer to run VMS on. There's still people who wanted, needed, not just wanted, but needed to run VAXs because to replace the VAX would require replacing a you know, $20 million whole factory because it was so much at the heart of it. So longevity of computing, you know, people think of computers as throwaway things, and a lot of them are, but <laughs> there's, there's a sufficient number that aren't that uh, longevity is important. Yeah, the, the, the similar. The, the, the problem with the railways, as you say, the, the, the time scale over which the kit lasts, the hardware, yeah. is so is totally different to that for which both the electronics hardware, but even more so the software. Are. But the, one of the saving graces is the rise of, of emulation, you know, virtual machine things. Particularly, uh, you're, you're probably aware that the, there's a, a piece of software called SimH, the Historic Computer Simulator written by somebody at DEC that will run on a, on a PC or laptop or a Linux thing and will absolutely perfectly emulate a, a whole range of computers including mm. PDP-11s and VAXs oh. and other things. Mm. And so I got, before LaserScan collapsed, I got a disk image from the VAX there, uh, put it into a single file on a, uh, these days on an SD card. <laughs> I, I can plug it into a, a, a Raspberry Pi <laughs> Uh, and boot up SimH and the Linux on the Raspberry Pi. And even with the, with the you know, Raspberry Pi is not the fastest computer in the world these days. Uh, and with the extra layer of, of emulation of having Linux there and then having SimH and then the, the VMS operating system and then the software, so you've got about five layers of software. It still runs ten times faster than the original machine did. Yeah. But, but that's good because then you can run these old operating systems without needing the old hardware necessarily. It, you know, if, if it is a pure software solution you're looking for. Chris, you were doing yeah. the same, weren't you? Uh, there, there, there is a simulator for this uh, that, 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 that's written by Terry Froggart in 1996 and that runs on a PC uh, and runs rather faster than the real thing. <laughs> you, um, could, you could put a card in a PC that made it look like an Apple II because we... we we, oh, yes. The first programmable radios at Telecom were, were programmed with Apple IIs, and then they were, you couldn't get Apple IIs anymore. So you could put this, yeah. you could put this card in, and that would then talk to the radio as if it was uh, and run on IBM PC. I actually used that to help a voluntary organisation who'd got a database on an Apple to get it into a format, a PC format. Yes, but it to, couldn't read somebody Apple floppy discs, could it? No, no, it was quite. The reading, <laughs> and I learnt an awful lot about the Apple disk format in the process <laughs> of doing this conversation. Unintentional. But the, the, the other thing that we're not talking about is communications. Oh, yeah. How fast yeah. that developed. I, yeah. I, in my job in, in London, 
uh, in 2002, I think it was, I, we, find, we got the first short-term ADSL su supply on a temporary phone line. Because until then, BT would do phone lines temporary, or they do ADSL temporary, but only on a, on a, a year's contract of phone line, which for a week's event was hopeless. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, one of my old student friends was fairly high up in PR and BT, who went to, the, to bang some heads together. Um, uh, after which, <laughs> the exhibit the, I, I was doing this for supporting the, the, the organisation of the event, and the exhibitors at it were really annoyed that they couldn't get uh, access to the internet. On their, on their stands, but we could get, you know, get it in the back, in the back room. Uh, but over the next two or three years, it completely, the situation raced ahead. And, fi and finally, any properly equipped exhibition centre had a lease line and, yeah. and a land. But, but th th at that stage, there was none of this, even in quite modern locations like the Bournemouth Centre and the Brighton Centre. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, there's still a few places that are relying on well, telex. I mean, not many, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> 75 balls. Facts. That's fact. yeah. <laughs> My, my first experience of, of computer to computer communication and, uh, outside of a building mm. was uh, doing computer science in 1974. We had to use, do some programming of a, 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 an equation solving software that would only run on a particular machine in, in Utah, in Salt Lake City in Utah. And so we had, there was one terminal in the computer lab there that was wired into the ARPANET, the, the American Advanced Research Project Agency's oh. network. The, the before, the, you know, we're before the internet thing. Um, this was still the days when domain addresses went the other way around, when you were uk.co. <laughs> um, the, uh, but so we, we used, we had to use this thing, and it was um, simplex, not duplex. So you, you typed and nothing came out. And then it, so the, the things went to the far end and got echoed back. So you, you were mm. typing thing and something you typed about half a minute previously was, was coming out, <laughs> yeah. uh, which was, was rather odd. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, that was my, my first experience of long distance communication. Yeah. And it was, I don't know what the board rate was, but I mean, the typical mm. board rate at the time was 110 bold, I mean, mm. 10, yeah. 10 characters a second. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, which, uh, yeah. My, my first experience of, uh, of online communications, uh, I had a, an acoustic modem, not dissimilar to this one. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's running at 300 board. And um, unfortunately, we only had a party line. Uh, and our next door neighbour complained that she f found that she couldn't use the telephone for hours on end because there was this ghastly warbling on it. Um, <laughs> that's the way it was. <laughs> But it went from you know, 110 to 300. I mean, it got, got up relatively quickly. I remember when I started work, we had things that would do communication at 9K6, 9,600 mm. boat. So that's, that's about 1,000 characters a second. Uh, but at, at that speed, it takes 20 minutes to download a megabyte. Yeah. Not a gigabyte, a megabyte. <laughs> um, so, uh, but now, you know, when I, mean, I get, what do I get? You know, 50, 50, 50 megabits per second at home yeah. now. It's, yeah. uh, it's amazing, yeah. really. Yeah. I, I could sit at home as if I was at my desk in the office in London yeah. with remote desktop. It just looked exactly the same as the computer. <laughs> Unfortunately, my colleagues at work didn't quite understand that. And one of them once left a, a post-it note stuck on the screen, not realising I couldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> but is it extraordinary? I mean, today you, c you can ping a computer in Australia and get an answer back in 25 milliseconds. Yeah. That's unbelievable. But they're still. But we're now down to things where hundreds of seconds, you know, thousands of seconds matter in some things. I had a, a, a colleague and a friend in the village who did um, buying and selling shares, and he did it for quite a while from home. And I'm talking within the last five years. Mm. Um, but in the end, he decided he needed to commute to London to get physically close to the stock market because the the, the just the delay of the electrons going down the wires <laughs> was was sufficiently much that somebody could get in ahead of him. You know, he, wow. the, the, yeah. the, the, the I mean, hundreds of thousands of yeah, seconds yeah. really mattered. Yes, I, I got involved in a legal dispute where somebody on two sides of the world sold the same shares at the same time. Right. Uh, and it came down to how the time signals had been synced around the world <laughs> right. and whether, in fact, Japan was 40 milliseconds behind the US or not. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
and she she loved that fruit uh, quite uh, quite early on. Uh, she no idea she's on her uh, various Apple devices like everybody else in her generation, <laughs> as is my son-in-law. But um, the the other one uses her IT for cinema these days, because which is another industry that's been completely transformed by electronics as physical film barely exists now <laughs> and it's much treasured by people who think analog is better than digital which is a debate we probably won't have here <laughs> yeah, we start off teaching kids about binary and hexadecimal and stuff like this mm. and they get bored so quickly because they want to be out there programming apps on an iPhone yes. and somehow if you start with hexadecimal you're never going to get to apps on an iPhone <laughs> are you? Um, and I don't know how to solve that because you need to have some understanding of the basics. But I, I see a, a lot of people nowadays, really quite intelligent people, who, who make ghastly mistakes in what they do because they treat whatever it is they're using as a black box. They have no understanding of what's inside it. They just treat the spec of, okay, if I put this into this box, that's what I'll get out. Yeah. And without understanding what's going on inside, you can easily go off the rails when the thing doesn't behave quite the way you expect. And you have no way to diagnose what's going on inside if it is just a black box to you. Mm. And an awful lot of it is just a black box today. So I just want to try to understand some of the basics because it'll help you when things go wrong. I, w I would say so, yes. But unfortunately it needs patience. And to make the basics sound exciting when really you want to do something really whizzy and high tech yeah. is a challenge. And the other thing about IT I found supporting computers is sometimes they are infuriatingly illogical as well. <laughs> <laughs> but my, coll my colleagues used to get really upset. They, I came, so my printer's not working. I went, went and looked at the infrastructure, but it's working for me. Uh, it's yeah. Obviously they decided because the IT man was there, it would now work. Yeah. This is, there's yeah. no logic in this. Yeah. I, mean, I think if you ask the question differently and you say, um, what will we in 25 years' time be wishing that we had said today, <laughs> yeah. you get a rather different sort of yeah. question. And I think that we will look back on the time now and realise that actually we gave away all our data. You know, the big data sets that people like Google are creating are going to give them enormous power over us. Yeah. And I don't think we have any concept of what we're walking into there. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, I, I think I, I was very privileged in a couple of ways. I mean, we as a generation were... I mean, I was a programmer for 25 years and I, I feel very privileged to have been that because I was being paid for doing a thing I would have done as a hobby. Uh, you know, uh, to, it's basically solving crossword puzzles you know, it, it's, and I was being paid for doing it. You know, de debugging software, people swear at it, but it, you know, it's, it's fundamentally gripping if you, you get into it. And it's create, programming is creative. You're starting with, with a blank slate and a few electrons and an idea, and you're creating something that if you do it right, it's, it's useful. If you do it right, it's elegant and possibly very long-lived. You, know, you can set standards and, 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 and affect the world. So it's, it, it really is a privileged thing to be a programmer. The, the other point, though, is I think it, you, we were a privileged generation because we had access, we were forced have access to the hardware and you mm. to get into programming you had to yeah. to to get down to the nuts and bolts because there was no other way to do it and because of that you could start from the bottom up and build the knowledge cumulatively and that's a better way in some ways of learning than starting at the top and digging down and finding some mm. bits and not others so um, I mean I I'm basically a software engineer but uh, I, I um, I got interested in the, the very early days of home computing, and so I bought a, uh, an Acorn Atom, uh, the predecessor of the, uh, the BBC Micro. Um, and at the time, Acorn would sell you a built one uh, for one price, and, but for somewhat less, they would, uh, I think it was about 120 pounds, I think. It was still quite a lot of money by, you know, the, the, the 19, whatever date we're talking. Um, 1991. No, support, right? <laughs> anyway, the um, so li living in, in so I ordered this kit and I was fairly early in the in the queue and so I used to ring them up and, and it was meant to be ready by so and so date and so and so date came and it wasn't so it, it was always I rang up and it was always going to be available next week and things so I got in the habit of once a week actually calling in at the office and and saying is it ready but in the end I think Chris Curry got fed up with me and just stayed into the back room came out with a bag of thing even before they got the box printed properly and said here it is do you want to go and take it away and things so I got I got home and laid out the pieces before I started putting it together and it all matched except there was one capacitor that didn't want it right and instead of one microfarad it was 
you know, instead of one peak of 10 picofarads, it was 10 microfarads, you know, a thousand times <laughs> the capacitance. So I rang up and, uh, and said, you know, this is wrong, you know, do I, should, or do I need a new one? And they, they went off, looked at the diagrams and came back and said, oh, a factor of a thousand doesn't matter for that one. <laughs> it, it, it's, the, yes. it's, the, it's the, after electricity goes on, it's the delay before actually starting doing any thinking. And it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, a, 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 a millisecond or a, or a, or a second, you know, it, 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 you know it, it a factor of a thousand doesn't matter. And I thought it was a lovely, a lovely concept. But, it, it, but then putting the thing together, and I put it together and soldered the bits and plugged it in, and it was absolutely dead. And I thought, oh, but at least I, I knew I had resources at work that could put a scope on it. Anyway, I got a, a multi-tester and just started testing the voltage and found a dry joint on the very first joint where the, the power supply came out of the board. Resolded that, sprang up, and it's all worked. But doing that taught me a lot about you know, how computers are built and what a processor and memory and is and, you know, and things. And then working with PDP-11s and things where memory was in very short supply, you, you had to learn about memory management and the importance of, of memory to speed and things. So people coming in now where your PC's got gigabytes of stuff, you know, they won't bother to learn that, but in some ways, therefore, they're losing some of that cumulative knowledge building. That, that, uh, so I think we, we were a privileged generation yeah. in that sense. So th does the fact that we've now got the Raspberry Pi and the BBC are also bringing out a, um, a new processor chip for, edu for education, is that going to make is that going to return people back to thinking on that basis? Mm -hmm. well, I hope so. I mean, the, the Raspberry Pi is an amazing achievement. I mean, they thought they would ship 100,000 of them, and they've shipped two million of the original <laughs> one, weren't they? I don't know how many they're up to now. Um, so yes, I mean, it, it's a throwaway computer. You know, you, you, it doesn't matter if you break it. It only costs 25 quid. You know, you just get another one. I mean, uh, so in concept, it's it's and. It, you know, it, it, it really is a, a good starting point for, for letting people loose on a computer and not worrying if they're going to break it.